What's up, dude? Standing at 6 foot 10, 230 pounds, Sean Kemp, aka the Rain Man, was an extremely intimidating beast of a man. In addition to that, he jumped like he had rockets shoved up his ass. Those two things made him one of the most electrifying players to ever play in the NBA. It's unfortunate a lot of dudes nowadays are unfamiliar with his game since he played back in the olden days, but in this video, I'm gonna change that. If you're like Lana Rhodes and enjoy yourself some Blake Griffin, you'll love Kemp. He was Blake Griffin before Blake Griffin. The man humiliated fools in the paint, flying through the air, slapping his nuts in dudes' faces, creating some of the most ridiculous posters you'll ever see. His dunks were extremely angry and he was fearless. There could have been a wall of fire and chainsaws blocking the hoop and Rain Man would still try to fly through it. The dude played so high octane it was like he snorted lines of nose candy during every game. Well actually he did, kind of. I'm not sure if it was during games, but later on in his career he abused crack. That was whack and it immensely affected his career. But before that he was a star giving the round mound of rebound and the 12 year old girl impregnator a run for their money as best power forward in the NBA. Growing up in Elkhart, Indiana, attending Concord High School, Kemp was a top two hooper in the state, and many would argue he wasn't too. His athleticism was shocking, superior to pretty much everyone who stood in his way. He was like a skinnier Zion Williamson. As a sophomore, the dude already had NBA scouts attending his games, and then two years later during his senior year, he was considered a top five player in the country. He also led his team to the state championship, but unfortunately they got their ass kicked 76 to 53. To make matters worse, Kemp had a scholarship to play at Kentucky but couldn't play there because he didn't get a 700 on his SAT. In other words, he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed and his bus may have been shorter than the ones his classmates took. Although Kemp couldn't play, he still enrolled at Kentucky but barely lasted a semester. This was because he allegedly stole two gold chains from the head coach's son, Sean Sutton. So his next semester, he transferred to a community college but didn't even play basketball there. Then after just one semester at the community college, he said fuck it and entered his name into the 1989 NBA draft. Going into the draft, Kemp was 19 years old without any college basketball experience. Despite this, the Seattle Supersonics were in love with him and picked him 17th. He was the youngest dude in the entire league. Because of this and how raw he was, Seattle didn't start him right away. As a rookie bench player, he averaged close to 14 minutes a night. During his limited play time, he put up pretty solid stats. In 81 games, he averaged 6.5 points, shooting 48% from the field to go along with 4 rebounds and nearly 1 block. It wasn't much, but it was honest work. Per 36, those numbers skyrocketed to 17 points, 11 rebounds, and over 2 blocks a game. The dude had so much more potential than anyone expected, and the very next year, the Sonics drafted the perfect guy to maximize it. During Kemp's rookie year, the Sonics weren't bad but not good either. They finished with a Hawks-like 41 and 41 record but must have sucked off a leprechaun or something because they got the second pick in the draft. With that pick, they chose the fast-paced clamp god floor general Gary Payton out of Oregon State. Right away, him and Kemp clicked. They were insane in the pick and roll. Gary was the yin to Kemp's yang. He complimented the Rain Man so perfectly, pushing tempo, allowing him to abuse fools with his unreal athleticism. In their first year together, Kemp Kemp's numbers shot up drastically. He averaged 15 points per game, shooting 50% from the field, 8.4 rebounds, 1.5 blocks, nearly 2 assists, and a steal. He had become a star. If you didn't have Gary by his side, his chances of success would have been drastically lower. Kind of like how if you're using your personal phone number to close business deals, you're not just mixing work and play, you're sabotaging your chances of success. A while back, I was looking to get my hair cut and I called this dude a friend recommended. When I was on the phone with him, it was immediately clear that he was using his personal phone. Boom. At first, it didn't really seem like a big deal, but then it turned extremely frustrating. He was distracted the whole time, and our call kept getting interrupted by other calls he was getting. Despite this, I still scheduled an appointment, and he said I would receive a confirmation email. I never got the email. So because of that, I decided to get my hair cut at a different place. The whole situation left me feeling frustrated and very unimportant. Using a personal phone number for business calls can lead to disorganization and missed opportunities. Not only can it look amateur, but you and your team are probably using 18 different apps to get your work done, right? Let the sponsor of this video, Nextiva, cut this down to one app. You get seamless, personalized customer interactions across all channels, and you can do this even if you're currently running your business off your personal phone and your CRM is a spreadsheet. You don't need any tech experience. You just need to download their app and follow the easy setup. You can make this one change and your business will look as polished as a Fortune 500 company, and you'll be able to focus on closing and scaling. This is the year to level up your business and lower your costs. Go to to try nextdiva.com slash MBA Goober to get 50% off your plan, or you can use the link in the description. Big thank you to Nextiva for sponsoring this video. Anywho, as a byproduct of Kemp's individual success, the Sonics made it to the playoffs.
playoffs. It was a step in the right direction, but they were only the eighth seed, which meant unfortunately they had to go up against the 63 win Portland Trailblazers led by Clyde the Glide. On paper, Kemp and the Sonics didn't have a snowball's chance in hell at moving on. Despite this, they managed to win two games, but as most predicted in the end, they lost. Kemp struggled in the first three games of the series, shooting below 30% from the field, but he was able to pick it up in the last two. It was his first postseason experience ever, so it was understandable he wasn't perfect. The next year, things kept progressing for them. They won 47 games and secured the sixth seed in the West. But for some reason, Michael Cage started at power forward for most of the regular season, making Kemp his backup. That year, Kemp played in 64 games, starting in only 23 of them. Although he started games on the bench, his production didn't fall off. He played 28 minutes a night and averaged 15 and a half points, 10 rebounds, two blocks, and a steal. And when the playoffs came around, he was made a starter once again and showed everyone why he should have been one in the first place. They played the third seeded Warriors in round one, and in the first game, Kemp led Seattle to a commanding win, putting up a dominant 28 points, 16 rebounds, and three blocks. The next game they lost, but that would be their only L of the series. Also, in that second game, Alton Lister punched Kemp, which would later turn out to be a terrible, career-tainting mistake. In the next two games, Kemp continued his domination, averaging 21 points and 15 rebounds, winning both games three and four. Not only did he put up amazing stats, but in game four, he got his revenge on Lister. Halfway through the second quarter, he caught a pass at the three-point line, charged into the paint, put poor Lister in a body bag, then taunted him after. The Lister blister, as it's referred to, was horrific, easily one of the nastiest posters of all time. After upsetting Golden State, the Sonics moved on to the next round where they faced Little John Johnny Stockton and the Kid Fucker. That that series did not go so well for Seattle. Utah tore them a new asshole and won in a gentleman's sweep. Kemp played alright, but he took a big step down from his performance in the first round, averaging 14 and 9, shooting 42% from the field. Entering year four with his first playoff series win under his belt, Kemp unlocked a new kind of confidence, and it showed on the court. This resulted in him being named an all-star for the first time ever. His stats were pretty much the same as the year before, but the Sonics had improved so much they were now one of the best teams in the league. Through 82, they finished with a record of 55 and 27, securing the third seed in the West. In the opening round of the playoffs, they had a rematch against Stockton and the guy who impregnated a 12 year old when he was in college. Unlike the year prior, Seattle had the Mormons number and one in five. Then in the second round, they really started to turn heads when they sent Hakeem and the Rockets home in seven, moving on to face Phoenix in the conference finals. At that point, the only thing that stood in their way of a finals appearance was the round mound of rebound. But as the nickname suggests, he was a very wide individual and they weren't going to get past him easily. The series went back and forth up until it couldn't anymore. Phoenix took game one, then Seattle took the next, and it went like that all the way through game six. Sean Kemp was a massive reason they were able to force a game seven. Through six games, he was averaging 21 points, shooting over 60% from the field, nearly four blocks, three assists, a steal, and nine and a half rebounds. The dude was cracked out, but he had to be perfect in game seven if he wanted to make it to the finals. Unfortunately, he wasn't. He put up a decent 18 points, shooting five for 12 from the field to go along with eight rebounds, and a couple steals and blocks. Pretty good, but Charles Barkley went nuclear, dropping 44 points and inhaling a whopping 24 rebounds like they were donuts. Because of that, Phoenix won 123 to 110 and moved on to the finals. After that Western Conference Finals run, the Sonics improvement came to a halt. Over the course of the next two seasons, they got bounced in the first round twice, one of which was at the hands of the eighth seeded Nuggets, who became the first eighth seed to ever beat a one seed. Kemp, on the other hand, kept getting better. He made two more All-Star games and also the All-NBA second team twice. At this point, he was 26 years old with six years under his belt entering the 95 to 96 season. He was at his peak and so were the Sonics. They started out the year losing seven times through their first 20 games, but then they finished the final 62, losing only 11 more, resulting in a 64 and 18 record, which was good for the best record in the West. Kemp was unbelievable during the regular season. He averaged nearly 20 points, shooting a highly efficient field goal percentage of 56% to go along with 11 rebounds rebounds, a steal, and 1.6 blocks. This stat line earned him his third All-NBA second team selection, fourth All-Star selection, and he even came in eighth for MVP voting. In the first and second round of the 96 playoffs, Kemp and the Sonics steamrolled through their competition. They won 3-1 against the Kings, then they swept Houston. The conference finals were a much different story though. For the third time, they met John Stockton, the Kid Diddler, and the Utah Jazz. Through four games, Seattle was looking good. They were up 3-1 and the finals looked to be in the palm of their hand. But then Piss started to dribble down their leg a little when Utah won two straight and forced a game seven. Lucky for Seattle, the Rain Man simply just wanted it more than Utah. With their season on the line, he had one of the greatest performances of his career, dropping 26 points and 14 rebounds 
on 8 for 12 shooting and 9 for 10 from the free throw line. They edged the Jazz winning by 4 and moved on to face the 72 and 10 God Squad Chicago Bulls led by none other than gambling legend Michael Jordan. I wish I could say the Sonics put up a fight but that just wasn't the case. The Bulls came out swinging like an NBA player when he sees his girlfriend slash wife. They won the first three games pretty much destroying Seattle's hopes and dreams. Kemp was able to get them two straight wins but the hole they were in was far too deep and the Bulls ended up winning in six. Although Kemp lost, he was arguably the best player in the series. On the NBA's biggest stage, he averaged 23 points, shooting 55% from the field, 10 rebounds, a steal, and two blocks. Voters recognized his elite production. He came in second for finals MVP, nearly becoming the second player to win the award despite being on the losing team. It was unfortunate they lost, but there was no doubt in anyone's mind they'd be back. While that was what everyone believed, unfortunately it didn't end up coming true. The 1996 finals ended up being the peak of Kemp's career. After that, he rapidly declined due to multiple factors. The main one was unhappiness with his contract. Back in 1994, he signed an extension with the Sonics and by 1997, he still had a few years left on it. The problem with that was he was unhappy with how much he was getting paid because guys who were worse than him were now signing for significantly larger deals. So in order to show his frustration, he sat out a training camp five preseason games and threatened to sit out the entire season. This is something many athletes have done, but in Kemp's case, it made absolutely no sense. The CBA didn't allow contract renegotiations in a player's final three years of his contract. So basically, neither Kemp nor the Sonics could do anything about it. Despite this, he still sat out to make a point. By the start of the regular season, he ended up giving in and joined the team again. He wasn't bad that year, but he had stopped getting better. Then by the offseason, he was fed up with Seattle and requested a trade. They obliged and said, him to Cleveland where he became the star of the team. But he also gained a ton of weight, ballooning up to like 300 pounds. His weight gain was caused by alcohol and an addiction to cocaine. I'm not really sure how someone can gain so much weight while being addicted to booger sugar, but I guess that just shows how down in the dumps he was. Because he was now chunky, his play style was more of a below the rim mid-range game rather than the high flying exciting game he once had. After just two seasons with Cleveland, there had been no success in the playoffs, so they traded him to Portland where he regressed into a role player. His time in in Portland was short-lived, then he made one last stop in Orlando, and just like that, his career was over. Although it ended abruptly, he had a fantastic career. He's one of the greatest in-game dunkers ever, and in my opinion, he should be in the Hall of Fame. If I had to pick a player who's the polar opposite of Kemp, it would be Kyle Korver. Nobody understands how good that dude was. You can click here to watch the video I made about him. Thanks for watching this one. Hope you enjoyed. Bye, dude.